How can you make money investing out of state? Well, you got to do your due diligence, right? And that's what we're doing here today. I'm going to be showing you how to do due diligence on an out-of-state rental property before you spend your money. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Welcome to the show, folks. This is the show where I work with people like you, everyday people like my man Carson, who is an out-of-state investor who is looking to make his money in the Cleveland market. Now, doesn't matter, though, if it's Cleveland or Detroit or Erie, Pennsylvania or Kansas City. It doesn't matter, okay? You have to go through the same level of due diligence in all these markets on any property you buy. There's several things you have to do when looking at a rental property outside of just looking at the rent and looking at the price okay you got to go through a lot of things to make sure the investment is going to work for you and that's exactly what i'm going to do for you carson right after this hey steve what are you doing oh nothing just saving money on my rental property insurance oh my steve take me now Holton Wise, real estate investing made easy. Wow, I'm so glad I clicked that link below. Welcome back. Let's pull up the property and let's really peel back the layers on this thing, right? Because it looks pretty good uh, from afar, right? The address 3415 West 95th, Cleveland 44102. West side of Cleveland, nice neighborhood. They got it priced at 114900 right? And looking at the photos, it's all brick, which is nice because you got Cleveland dealing with, like, you don't really want the wood siding, right? Like, see this guy next door here, right? Like, see this dude's house? He's got, like, peel and paint or something on his wood siding. That could be, like, a lead-based paint issue. You don't want to have to deal with that, right? So if we have a brick house, that eliminates it, right? Like, you see we have some of those issues on our wood porch here, right? But the majority of our structure is not going to be wood so that's nice inside we have some dated units right this kitchen's definitely from the 70s and you're going to see that that surely affects the rent roll okay oh, a little little george foreman grill action here uh, if we were to take this over just so you know we have to actually let them know they can't do that because that's a freaking fire hazard also i don't i don't know why but they also got two more over here right so and there's like the old, the crazy looking office chair, right? So this, this, this whole upstairs porch area here, this is just a whole mess, right? But we'll take care of that little gym action in the attic. I don't know why of all the photos, that's the one the agent chose to give us. Crummy garage. Uh, here's an important photo, shows our big ticket items, right? You got a furnace here and looks like you got another one tucked away right there. Both furnaces appear to be pretty new. I would guess they're at least in the first 10 years of their life. You could see a hot water tank here, probably about 10 years old as well. Shot of the back. The brick is looking pretty good, right? I'm pretty pumped on the brick. The driveway is all jacked up, but pretty cool with the city of Cleveland. There is no point of sale system like some of our suburbs have, so nobody should really give you a problem on that, and it won't affect the rentability. All right, so that is the photos and what this is, right? It's listed at 114.9. What you could do market-wise, like market rent, your market rent expectations are great. 1500 in rent, 18 for the year. You add in your fixed and variable expense estimates, right? You should be profiting roughly 8,231.92, right? And that's me taking into account vacancy turnover, those tenants not actually paying rent, capital expenditures, right? Like every year I have you saving 900 bucks, right? I said those furnaces were in the first 10 years of their life cycles, right? Well, you got two furnaces in this property. They both cost about three grand to replace and they're both going to last about 30 years, right? So sometime in the next 20 years, you're going to be spending that six grand, right? That uh, hot water tank, it's probably about 10 years old. I'm guessing the other one's about the same, right? Those last about 15 years cost a grand each, right? So probably in the next five years, you're dropping two grand, right? And a hot water tank. So that's why we're saving 900 every year towards that, right? So your, your NOI of 8,231, 
It's not including, right? I'm backing out. Like there's actually coming in, right? Why things are occupied and you're not making those repairs, right? You got another like 2100 coming in, but we're not counting that as profit because I know you're eventually going to spend it, right? So this thing should clear 82 plus that money you're saving, right? And as far as the price goes, I'll get into why this is shortly here, but I don't think it's worth 114.9. I think it's worth 105. Now, at 105, if you were to buy it, it's a 16.2% cash on cash return. You only put down 26. The bank puts in 78. Everything sounds great, right? So, looking at this from afar, okay, it's listed at 115. He says we could get it for 105. It's like a 16% cash on cash return. That must be awesome. Let's do the deal. Hold on. We got to do a little bit more digging, right? We really need to analyze this, especially for the people out there that are going into new markets, right? You have to understand exactly what it is that you are and are not getting what exactly you're dealing with, right? First, let's talk about the price point. 115 that's too high. I don't think you need to spend that. Other properties are selling in the 100 range, right? So just based upon the comps, the comps alone say 105. Now, I know if you're running your calculations just based on the cash on cash return, I mean, sure, that's great. It's 1% ratio. Let's do it, 115. But you do, you shouldn't have to because you're overpaying, right? Because if, if, if you can't take this deal down for the right price, which is 105, we could just find you a different one. We could just replace this property with a different one. So you don't need to pay the 115. Now, that's the other thing, though, right? Getting you to that 1% ratio, right? 750, 750. The current tenants are not paying that, right? The current tenants are actually only paying 575 and 580. Part of the reason those tenants are not paying market rent is because they've clearly been there forever. The listing agent says they've been there forever. The kitchen tells me they've been there forever. It looks like they've been there since like the 70s, right? So how do we go from 575, 580 all the way up to 750, right? Do we just take it over and immediately up the rent almost 200 bucks? Can we legally do that? Yes, we can legally do that as long as we give the tenants a 30-day notice, right? They are on month-to-month uh, -month leases. In the state of Ohio, 30-day notice, you're good to go. Does that make sense from a bottom line perspective, from a landlord's perspective making money, right? Will that be the smartest play for us? Probably not, because if you increase their rent that much right after a new acquisition, a lot of times it's going to force the tenants to just move out, right? You're creating an artificial turnover. We're already calculating turnovers into our long-term metrics here, but you never want to create turnovers when you don't have to have turnovers, right? As soon as a property transfers, that's when the tenants are the most likely to move out because they're nervous, they're scared, new things are happening. You slam a huge rental increase on them, you're almost guaranteed to, to boot them out. And you don't want to do that because those two units were dated as all hell, dude. We're probably looking at like 10 Gs, right? Each unit to, to, to get those to attract a new tenant at 750. So what we want to do is keep these two tenants that don't have an issue with how dated it is because it's their stuff, right? They, they're part of the reason why it's dated. They've been there forever, right? So what we want to do, get them on a new lease just in case they don't pay rent or we run into any issues with them. We want them on a new lease under our terms at the same rent. So if we have to evict them, it's easy. The worst thing you could do is take over a property, go to court on the very first month with no lease. The tenants, all they got to do is tell the judge, hey, I didn't know he bought the property. I didn't know who to pay rent. I paid the old guy. Will the tenant win the case because they said that? No, but you know what they will do? They'll at minimum get the case continued one or two more times, which at minimum is going to double or triple your legal fees, right? You don't want that to happen. So you get them on the new lease, okay? Same rent. And then a year later, when everything's calmed down and they realize, hey, working with the new landlord, it's no problem, no big deal, that's when you start hitting them with the annual rental increases. So the goal should be to get up to that 750 without a turnover because turnovers are going to kill you, right? And then that's the next thing. In a neighborhood like this, okay, you don't want your property to be vacant. And when you can lock in on a good long-term tenant, you want to, right? Because when you're in low-income neighborhoods, what you guys have to understand, this is also part of your due diligence process, is you're not getting like a whole slew of like Two people, both college educated, 700 credit scores, this or that, right? That's just not the reality of these low-income neighborhoods, right? Like Section 8 tenants, tenants on SSI, uh, you know, blue-collar folks. That's your tenant base, right? 
in dealing with tenants who run into issues with their lives where they can no longer pay the rent, right? Like if the car breaks down, they're probably using the rent money to fix their car, things of that nature. You're going to run into evictions in your career, right? So you don't want that to happen. We count account for it in our numbers and factor it in. But if we have tenants like we do here that have proven they will pay every month, we want to keep them in the property as long as we can because I guarantee you, you will make more money on a rental if you rent it to one tenant below market rent for 10 years straight than if you rent it to 10 different tenants over 10 years above market, right? Having 10 turnovers in 10 years will lose you more money than the money you lo uh, lost off the top renting it below market, right? Especially when you're in a neighborhood like this, right? Because the other thing is too, if you're in like an extremely nice neighborhood, you have extremely responsible tenants, when they move out, there's a good chance your apartment's in almost room clean condition. When people move out of properties like this, that's not often the case, right? You're doing a lot of repairs and stuff over and over and over again, right? So these are all the things you guys have to think about before you actually make the purchase, right? So it's just a lot more involved than, oh, it hits the 1% roll, must be a great deal. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.